before this recording, you really need to have gone three point through the activity 3.02, and you need to have a periodic table in front of you. Without these two things, um, this lecture is going to be impossible to follow. So earlier I had you guys do an atomic history project, and Rutherford really modified a lot of the ideas of Thompson and Dalton. And in 1911, um, it was essentially known that the atom has a nucleus, the nucleus is small, dense, and positively charged, and that atoms are mostly empty space. So Rutherford, this guy here, um, those were the things that he discovered using his gold foil experiment. Now there still were some difficulties with this theory. Um, one, neutrons weren't discovered yet, that was still a couple more years away. And the other was he knew that the electron or the nucleus was positively charged and these electrons were out there, but he couldn't explain why the electrons were not attracted and sucked into the nucleus. Okay? He didn't really have much structure to the electrons. Two years later, his student, Niels Bohr, um, came up with the planetary model. And what Bohr said is that the electrons are arranged in orbits around the nucleus. So now you've got the nucleus, which is, you know, like the sun in the center of the solar system, and then you've got these electrons going in orbits. As you can see here in the picture, here's the electrons going around like planets. Often you see pictures of an atom depicted like what you're seeing here on the top right and the bottom left. Um, and this is an idealization of an atom, much like a heart doesn't look like that. Boy, that's a lousy drawn heart. Okay, like this. So wh while that's like a cartoon of a heart, this is kind of a cartoon of an atom. So this is a simplification, but it still is a nice way to think of it in a way that our brains can comprehend. So Bohr was the first one to answer the question, why electrons are not sucked into the positively charged nucleus like magnets. And what he said is that electrons are in a particular path, okay, those, that path, are the orbitals and they have a fixed energy level and it's almost like they're in a track those circles we saw okay and since there's no loss or gain of energy there's no real collapse into the nucleus now this doesn't 100% explain things but um, he really was on the right track and in a few minutes you'll see what the modern theory is but a lot of what Rutherford discovered and Bohr discovered, um, we still believe to be true today. So in your activity, it talked about the energy levels of an electron and you had that boarding house analogy. And with the boarding house, the different floors where the bunk beds were are considered to be the energy levels. And those energy levels are the region around the nucleus where the electron is likely to be moving. And now, you've got these fixed energy levels. And the way I like to think of it is like a ladder. Okay, and you've got these steps on my very crooked ladder there. And just like you can't step in between a step on the ladder, boom, you'd fall down. Okay, neither can an electron. You have to actually be on one of these rungs, okay? And these steps would be the energy levels. Okay, so uh, energy levels, same idea. That would be the steps on the ladder, all of these right here. <coughs> Now, the lowest energy level is equivalent to the lowest step on the ladder. The higher the energy level, the further you are away from the nucleus. So here you can think of the nucleus, like right down here, here's the nucleus. And then here are, this would be my lowest energy level, and this would be my highest energy level. Now, just like you can go up and down a ladder, the electrons can go up or down energy levels. And again, we saw that with the activity we did last week in 3.01, the one you did electronically, 
and you saw that electrons could go from like n equals 2 to n equals 4. Okay, so they're going up the ladder. Or, and let me change colors here, they can go down the ladder. So they could go down, drop back down their energy level from like n equals 4 to n equals 2. And when they do that, in those little diagrams, it had that squiggly line, and that squiggly line is a photon, which is light being given off. Okay, so this is now this lecture is now starting to tie together the two things you saw last week. Now, in 1926, which was about 11 years after, or 15 years after Bohr, Erwin Schrödinger came up with the modern description of the atom and that is called the quantum mechanical model. So you need to be familiar with this name. This is still considered to be the modern description of the atom. We haven't really come up with a better theory yet. And it is based on the probability of where you will find an electron, okay? So um, you'll see in just a moment here, but I wanna change my ink color because otherwise you won't see it. So. The quantum mechanical model sometimes is also called the fuzzy cloud, okay? Because you have this picture right here, which is essentially a picture of an atom where the electrons have appeared. So what happens is they'll take a picture and there'll be like electrons showing up in these different areas. And they'll take a whole bunch of these pictures and lay them on top of each other. And that is called a composite. And when they do that, when you stack these pictures, you start to see these patterns emerge. So right here, you can see there's this region right here. If I had to put money on where an electron is, I would guess right there. If somebody else took that and I had to pick somewhere else, I would pick right here or right here, okay? So again, this is all based on probability of where an electron is found. Can an electron be outside of one of these probable areas? Absolutely. If you look real close, I've got some dots right up here, some electron pictures down here, the electrons up there, you know, here's one over here, all where they're outside of the expected area. And so what's happening is Sometimes the electrons end up there because they end up in the excited state. So what we're seeing is that electron, you know, your nucleus would be right here in this region. Okay, that electron maybe gets popped out for a little while, boom, up into an excited state, and then ultimately it generally comes back into the fold like that. Now, a quantum, a quantum is an actual um, vocabulary word here. What the quantum is, is it is a unit of energy required to go up one step. So that is a quantum, okay, to go up one step. If I want to go up two steps, so if I want to go up two steps, one, two, we would say that requires two quanta of energy. To go up three steps would be three quanta, quanta also. So you've got quantum, which is singular, and you have quanta, which is plural. That should be an A there. Okay. <coughs> Now your energy levels, here's all your terminology again, your energy levels are made up of sublevels, which are made up of orbitals, okay? And so here we saw this ring diagram last week, again, another activity. Here's that N equals those energy level numbers. <laughs> and if you take a look here, energy levels are designated by principal quantum numbers one through N. Now, if you take a look at your periodic table, Okay, so you're looking at your periodic table, and here's my crudely drawn periodic table. If you count how many rows there are on the periodic table, you should notice that there are 
seven rows on the periodic table. Okay, And don't forget these two squeeze into six and seven. These seven rows corresponds to these seven quantum numbers. Okay, this is why there's seven rows on the periodic table because there are seven principal quantum numbers or another way to say it is there are seven energy levels on the periodic table and those correspond to the rows. We're going to get into why it has this funky shape, why there's nothing there here in just a little bit, and why this group is separated down there. Now, you first you've got your energy levels. Underneath your energy levels, you have sublevels. Okay? And actually, there's more than sub four sublevels. There could be infinite. Inf in <coughs> Let's try that word again. There can be infinite number of sublevels. But right now, these are your four primary ones, S, P, D, and F. And you do want to remember them in a certain order. And my first year of teaching, my students came up with this way to remember it, and it has stuck with me ever since stupid people die first. Okay? The other way to remember that is short people do fine. So some people like that one. Now, in these energy levels, you can hold only so many electrons. The maximum number of electrons you can figure it out, you can um, have in an energy level is 2n squared. Okay? And remember, n is equal to your energy level that you find on the periodic table. Okay? So this little formula will help you figure it out. So if we practice this, there's our formula again. If we talk about the first principal energy level, so first square the 1. 1 times 1 is 1, and then multiply it by the 2. So in the first principal energy level, the maximum number of electrons it can hold is 2. In the fourth energy level, where n is equal to 4, do the square first. <coughs> 4 times 4 is 16, and then multiply it by 2, you have 32 electrons. Let's do one more. Try to figure out the seventh principal energy level. So 7 squared is 49, and multiply that by 2. And in the seventh principal energy level, you can actually hold 98 electrons. Okay, so this is a chart that just shows you the pattern. You've got your principal energy levels. Remember, those are your rows on the periodic table. And then each energy level has an equal number of sublevels. So SPD, SPDF, and then it goes in the order of the alphabet, SPDFG, and then H, I, J, K, etc. You could even have, we don't have an eighth row on the periodic table yet, but then we would have eight sublevels, and they would go SPDFG, H, I, J for the type of sublevels. Now, some books and things you read might cut this off at four sublevels here, and they probably don't even acknowledge G, H, and I. But the reason they do this is because we haven't discovered those elements yet that take up those spots. Could they be out there? Could we still make them? Possibly. But that would be the pattern for what happens after seven, okay? Now, this is a handy chart that you really should memorize. You've got your S, P, D, and F, okay? So your stupid people die first. And you've got your number of orbitals, one, three, five, and seven. So the easiest way to remember this is stupid people die first, and then it is your odd numbers. Now, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. And when you guys were doing that other activity, okay, each one of those little boxes in 3.02 with the arrows is an orbital. So a box here is equal to an orbital. And so each one of those boxes could hold two arrows. So if I've got one orbital, I can hold a maximum of two electrons. If I have two orbitals, I can hold six. Five orbitals, 10. Seven orbitals, 14. 
okay? And the pattern just keeps repeating. So if I had sublevel G, I would expect nine orbitals, which means I could hold a maximum of 18 electrons. And then I could have sublevel H, which would have 11 orbitals, and that would hold a maximum of 22 electrons. So you can see how the pattern builds from what we already know. <clears throat> Okay, so the question is here, how many sublevels are in the following energy levels? So we're looking at the first principal energy level, okay? So that's the first row on the periodic table. So if we take a look, the first energy level, S, you have one sublevel. So the answer to this one is one. And how many sublevels are in the fifth principal energy level? Take a look at the chart, okay? When you take a look at the chart, you should discover that there are five sublevels. Okay, S, P, D, F, and G. This is one that always tricks students. How many orbitals are in the following sublevels? And now you're given one S. Well, this is the chart you wanna look at. How many orbitals are in S? just one. So the answer to this one, one orbital. If I am talking about 3s, this is the one time chemistry is not like math. You do not multiply those numbers. For 3s, I would have still just one orbital because the s tells me how many orbitals there are. So this would be one also. If you look at your chart, 6p, how many orbitals would you expect? You would expect three orbitals. And then F, that F right there tells you seven orbitals, okay? I could call it 15,000 F, 15,000 rows on the periodic table. The answer would still be seven orbitals to that question. So we talked about S, P, D, and F. And this really starts to show you how the periodic table is arranged. So you're gonna start writing your own electron configurations now. So you can see, you might wanna outline on yours. This is what many students do, and this is what we do in lecture. You've got your D block here in the middle, okay? So those are your transition metals, our D block. Notice this helium right here. Helium fills in this gap right there and fills in the S block. Right. And then P block is everything else on this side, right there. And then your two rows down at the bottom are F block. And so that's why the periodic table has the shape it does as opposed to just being a row after row and list after list of elements like that. Why it just isn't a straight box. Okay, so one thing also you wanna write on your periodic table is S and P equal the row number and D is equal to row number minus one. So remember, we have these row numbers on our periodic table and those correspond to the energy levels. Okay, and so that's what I'm talking about here with the row number. So this would be 1S, this would be 2S, this is 3S, 4S, 5s, oops, not 56, 5s, um, 6s, and 7s. And then same thing with over P, over here with P, it's equal to the row number. This would be 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, p. I really want to write 56. Uh, oops, okay, and then 6p. But it gets interesting here in the D block. Now with that one, okay, now I take away one from the row number. So instead of being 4D, at this point I'm 3D and 4D, 5D and 6D. And then down here, these F blocks, you take away two from the row number. So since this is row six, this would actually be 4F and 5F, okay? So there's no real need to label your periodic table. 
um, that part. You might just want the S, P, D, and F, and then these row numbers. So if you know this top box and the row numbers and what the different blocks are called, you'll be fine. Okay, so now we're actually going to start writing some electron configurations. Oh, look, here's a neat version of what I was just drawing out for you guys. Okay, so you can see how it lines up with this. Much nicer drawing than my own. All right, so let's practice a couple of uh, electron configurations. You always want to start with hydrogen, okay, and read the periodic table left to right like a book. So here, and I'm going to number my rows. Five, six, seven. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, I start with hydrogen, and hydrogen is in row one, and it's in the S block. And remember, helium fits in right here. Okay, and how many elements are there in hyd in the S block? One, two. Now I am going to keep reading left to right until I get to lithium. Well, boom, boom, boom. I go that way. I go down to the next line. Now I'm in row two. I'm in the S block, S block, and I am in the first element in the S block, okay? And that's my electron configuration for lithium. Let me change colors again, all right? And do another one. We'll do carbon this time. Again, always start at hydrogen, go left to right like a book, okay? It's row one, S block, and it is two elements across, one S2. Now I'm down in row two, S block, right here, these two elements, two S2. I want to keep going till I get to carbon right here. But now I've just crossed into P block right here. So I'm still in row two, but now I'm in P block. How many elements do I have to go into? One, two. Two elements into P block, okay? So that's how you were getting those electron configurations um, that you saw last week in the activity. Now, a neat thing about these electron configurations is you can take these little superscripts here at the top and add them up. Two plus one is three. Three electrons. Three electrons should be my element number. Here, two plus two plus two, six electrons. And carbon is element number six. So that's a quick little way to check yourself and see how you're doing on the electron configurations. All right? Let's try another one. We've got fluorine. So we find fluorine. You're going to read left to right like a book. You're going to start 1s2. Okay, that takes me up to, that takes care of hydrogen and helium. Now I'm in row two. Here's row two. I'm in S block again and two elements across, lithium and beryllium. Still in row two, but I cross into P block. So now I'm in P, here's P. And I am one, two, three, four, five elements in to row P. And there's your electron configuration for fluorine. Try out neon right now. Pause the video and try and write what you think neon is going to be. What you should notice is that all these electron configurations are very repetitive. 1s2, 2s2, 2p, but fluorine was five, neon is just one more over, 2p6, okay? And there's your electron configuration for neon. So I'd like you to do one more on your own before I show you another trick here. Try and get to element number 14, silicon. Pause the video. And try it out. Okay, so reading left to right, starting at hydrogen, 1s2, now I'm in row 2, 2s2, coming across, I go all the way across P, and that's six elements across. Row 3, 3s2, and I keep going, and now I'm into P block and I am two elements into P block, okay? And if I check, I add up my little numbers, my superscripts, two plus two plus six plus two plus two, okay? It equals 14 electrons, which is what I would expect. <coughs> okay, 
Now we're gonna do one for the transition metals down here in D block. And one of the things we had down here is D equals row number minus one. And I'm gonna change my ink color so it's a little bit easier to see. Okay, so remember, we've got these row numbers here. All right, and we are gonna go for titanium right there. So again, very redundant, 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, Okay, so 3S2 takes me up here to magnesium. I want to keep going. I'm in row 3 still, still in P block. Takes me up to argon. There's six elements across. Now I'm going to go into row, back to row 4. 4, P. Oops, not P. What am I saying, huh? That is S. So let's erase that. <coughs> not arrow, pen. Okay, 4, S2, but here, right here, I cross into D block. Now, this is row four, but with D block, remember the row number goes down run. So now I'm in 3D, and how many elements do I count in? I count in two. So 3D2. And that's the electron configuration for titanium. Now, if I were to keep going, Let's just say I kept going to, let's say I wanted to go to um, arsenic, number 33. I would do all the rest, except for then it would be 3D10. And then I'm now, when I cross back into P block, my row number goes back to normal, because P is equal to the row number, and I'm at 4P3. Right? So if you were to do arsenic, that's what it would look like. Okay, so you try strontium now. So strontium's down here, number 38. Pause the video and try this one out. So you should have gotten 1s2, 2s2, 2, ah, I hold it down too long there, 2p6. That takes me up to neon, <coughs> 3s2. 3P6, now I'm up to argon, 4S2, I'm going into D block, so I subtract 1 away from the row number, 3D10, now I'm going back to P block, 4P6, and I come around, and here's my last little bit, I am in, find my spot there, 5S2. So what you're doing at this point is Strontium has 38 electrons. We can see this on the periodic table. And you are giving the address for every single electron in strontium. Okay, So that is where we would expect them all to hang out. In energy level 1, closest to the nucleus, there's a little S subshell. We expect two electrons to be there. In energy level 2, okay, you've got <coughs> eight more electrons hanging out, and so on and so forth. You should be able to recognize them backwards and forwards, okay? So if you take a look at this, check and see which element I'm talking about. Hopefully, you come to the conclusion it's chlorine, okay? I'll give you another one. This one's a little longer. Pause the video and figure out which one I'm looking at. Okay, if you add up the superscripts here, okay, 2 plus 2 plus 6, that's 10. So these right here add up to 10 electrons, plus 2, 6, and 10, that's 10 more, plus this 10, plus I've got 6 and 2, which is 8, and then 3 more electrons right there. So if I add this all up, I have 30 plus 11, which gives me 41 electrons. 41 electrons is niobium right there, okay? So if you weren't catching it back on the chlorine slide, how I figured that out, okay, that's the way you can do it. You can add up all the superscripts there at the top 
and it will tell you which element it is, okay? So do one more, okay, and don't skip this one, even if you're bored, okay? It did change. The ending's a little different on this one, okay? So pause and check this one out. Now, most students come up with one of two answers. They come up with molybdenum, number 42, or technetium, number 43, one of those two elements. Some students think that they are going to be really smart and save a lot of time, okay? And they say, all you have to do is look at this one, okay? And they'll go, hey, 4D5. One, this is row four for D, this is one, two, three, four, five, and that would get you element 43. But what they're neglecting to notice is you've got only an S1 right there in an excited state, okay? So you wanna pay close attention, add up all the numbers. Okay, there's 10, and then there was 10 more, and then there was 10 more, okay, and six, plus one is seven, plus five more is 12, and then I get 42 electrons. So your correct answer was molybdenum, okay? Not technetium. So the right answer is number 42, which is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, okay? So don't fall for that mistake. If you only look at the last section of the electron configuration, you'll be right 